So now the second speaker of this session is uh, Man Dr. Manuel de Ricker, uh, originally a biotech engineer, a biotech engineer from Belgium, did his PhD in the uh, uh, University of Cincinnati, Cincinnati Ohio, before uh, joining the um, former ICRF, which is now called CRUK, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, in Peter Parker's lab, so one of the, the protein kinase C uh, expert, where he set up a few high content screens, as you might know, protein kinase C translocating from the cytoplasm of the membrane, or at least that's what I knew 20 years ago, it was like this. So, Still um, <laughs> and then he joined uh, University of Dundee, the drug discovery unit, a few years ago, we, where he's responsible for all the kinetoplastid uh, phenotypic uh, screens. Thank you. Thank and you, his presentation uh, will be, you will, all, you will know all, everything about uh, high throughput, high content screen after his presentation. Thank you very much. Um, like Gerald, I was a bit daunted by my title as well, uh, Next Generation of High Throughput Screen. So I've got a, a little subtitle to cover what I'm really talking about so that I don't uh, disappoint you too much. Um, and so I want to give a different perspective um, from the previous present, uh, presentation, which is basically the perspective from the drug discovery um, point of view. And I suppose what I hope that we can get out of this conference is that we can bring these views together of what um, people looking at the really physiological relevant assays and people looking at the high throughput assays, um, how we can bring all this together in something that really works. Um, so what I'll do is I'll give you a brief introduction uh, as to who, uh, who we are uh, what programs we run, and then I'll go through the three uh, kinetoplastid parasites. Um, very short section on T. brucei, and then a bit more detail on T. cruzi um, and Leishmania. First of all, the drug discovery unit. So we are a, an integrated biotechnology style uh, unit with, with all the expertise that you can see here. And so together with, the, uh, with academic collaborators and the pharmaceutical industry, we are able to, to start from a disease idea and to take and identify compounds and take them all the way through uh, to the clinical candidate stage, um, at which stage then we, we also um, can hand over things to the NDI. In terms of what we do in the drug discovery unit, we are um, basically split into two major areas. Um, one area is the innovative targets, and that's basically where we uh, de-risk interesting targets for usually diseases of the developed world um, so that they can be partnered uh, with pharma. And then the other arm um, is obviously the neglected diseases, um, where we are currently focusing on TB, uh, malaria, and obviously the kinetoplastids. Um, and we are also, in the meantime, trying to develop uh, new platforms uh, for drug discovery. And you can see some of the, the funding agencies um, that we work with and some of the collaborators. In terms of uh, trypanosomes, so we have programs uh, on visceral leishmaniasis, Chagas disease, um, HAT, and Nagana. And so um, our main programs are basically programmed with the Wellcome Trust, where we work in collaboration with GSK, uh, mainly on Lishmania and Chagas, and then another major collaboration with DNDI, which focuses mainly on uh, visceral Lishmaniasis. Um, and then we have support from GalvMed to look at uh, Nagana. So in terms of approaches, we both use uh, target-based approaches uh, and phenotypic screening approaches. Um, I, I'm not going to go into any detail about uh, the target-based approaches, but I do want to say is that we are always looking for targets to work with uh, and collaborators to work on targets. So if anybody has any ideas or wants to work together, please um, come and see us. What I do want to talk about mostly is the in vitro assays that we run for screening. Um, and so they fit in our sort of cascade here where we do the assays and then we do our DMPK assays uh, to then get into in vivo efficacy and eventually be able to start. Um, lead up programs. So the problem we, in, we struggle with in general when we set up these in vitro assays is that we have to balance these different factors um, to design the assays. So our assays need to be high throughput. I mean, really what we need to do for these diseases is be able to access a large variety of compounds, so large numbers of compounds, so you need to have a high throughput screen. Um, but at the same time, it's obviously very important that what you identify is predictive of the activity in the in vivo animal model and, of course, eventually in, in, in the human being. And whatever you do, it needs to be as robust as possible so that your assays work and you get results on time. And so I, I think what we have learned is that you cannot really do this in one assay. Um, and so what 
our approach is currently is basically we start with a primary assay, which is more of a, a, a high throughput assay, and we then follow up with secondary and sometimes tertiary assays um, to get more into the sort of predictivity um, area. And so I think what we can do here is actually at the end of this is work together with people that run the really physiologically relevant molecules and have our molecules um, verified at that stage. So I'll start briefly with Tibrusia. I'm not going to spend any time on introductions. I think uh, most of you will be very familiar uh, with these diseases. Um, but so obviously we are looking at bloodstream form uh, trips and they are free living, so they are fairly easy to assess uh, when it comes to high throughput screening. Um, this is the basic outline of our high throughput assay. We have three H4 well plates in which we uh, dispense compounds. Then we add the bloodstream form parasites and then uh, basically we incubate three days with the parasites and then we read uh, sort of, um, in this case, resazarin, so a live um, cell readout. And what I want to show is just one example of a series that we identified and how we've been misled really by the assay um, that we've been using. So this is the potency curve for a series labeled DDU1 here, uh, which looked really interesting to us to work on. So we had good activity in our routine assay um, around 0.2 micromolar. This went down through our uh, DMPK pro uh, processes and we had good pharmacokinetic properties for these compounds. So everything pointed to them being suitable and good for in vivo efficacy. When they went into our uh, acute mouse model, we saw no activity at all. So this was surprising and, and, and worrying for us because of course everything we do is trying to get molecules that do show in vivo efficacy. And so we spent a bit of time investigating why we didn't have this, um, this, this result. And so the first thing we really did was starting to look at rate of kill of these compounds and sidality of the compounds. I mean, is this series of compounds actually um, killing the parasites in spite of, you know, it does say 100% inhibition here. And so these are the results of a rate of kill experiment. And the conclusion is really in this table where for some of the control compounds, we saw that the concentration at which the compounds are sidal is around tenfold higher than the EC50 seen in the assay, which is kind of what we would expect. However, for DDU1, we saw that we almost needed 300 times more compound compared to the EC50 to see sidal activity. And this explained why we didn't see anything in vivo, because we never could achieve that sort of concentration at which we saw sidality in vitro. Um, but it doesn't explain, of course, why we see 100% inhibition in our routine assay. And so to explain that, I'll show you a bit of detail uh, around our two assays. So, um, this depicts the, the routine assay, and so we have the starting density of cells here versus time, and so it's a three-day assay. Um, and what happens really is that we start below the detection limit of the assay. And so when compounds are untreated, they grow as normal. But if they are treated, there are three scenarios. You may have growth slowing compounds, you may have static uh, compounds where there's no growth, and you may actually have compounds that show sidle activity. Now, because we are so far below the detection limit, um, at the 72 hours, we would not reach the detection limit with any of these three types of compounds. And so basically, this assay was reporting not only sidal compounds, but all sorts um, of less interesting compounds. So the modification we made is that we started at a much higher density, which is above the detection limit, and this then allows us um, to differentiate between these uh, different scenarios. And so if you look at the potency curve, well, this is just the one I showed you before, you get 100% inhibition. If you now run the same compound in the other assay and you look at the potency curve, we saw uh, biphasic behavior for this compound. And so we're initially um, here, we basically saw 100% inhibition in the routine assay. We now only see the 100% inhibition at the concentration where we had sidal activity. So what was happening is basically this, curve ha this compound has biphasic behavior, probably two mode of actions. And the first mode of action gave sufficient reduction of growth so that we didn't reach the detection limit, but not enough to actually kill um, the parasites. So it's an example um, where when we saw 100% inhibition, and a lot of us might think of that as 100% cell killing, well, it's not. In this case, it was just the fact that we did not reach the detection limit. And so it's very important to interpret um, your results and, and look deeper into them uh, before you can draw conclusions. So that's just one example from our, cruise, uh, from our Bruce AI, uh program, which has an impact on everything else that I'm showing you here. So moving on to T. I then. Um, again, you, you know all this, so I'm, I'm not spending any time on that. Um, what I do want to say is in the, uh, in the life cycle, well, the part that we are interested in 
is the intracellular stage where the parasites multiply as amastigotes inside, uh, inside cells. So this is the kind of assay, an intracellular uh, T. cruzi assay that we wanted to set up to um, identify new, new uh, hits. So the purpose of the screening cascade we developed um, was to identify hits that basically kill uh, cruzi that are potent, uh, that are selective over the host cell, that are sidal, which is something we learned from our Russia program. Um, and we also didn't want to pick up any CYP51 uh, mode of action compounds just because they are worked on heavily and, and don't seem to be uh, that successful. So this is the screening cascade we run uh, for T. cruzi now routinely. Um, and so I'll go into detail uh, for each of these steps, but we basically we have a single point screen that we start with in the intracellular assay. This is followed up with a, a tri-point assay where we test at three concentrations, followed up by a 10 point potency assay, and every time there's a selection step. So that we move then into the rate of kill static sidle assay, as well as a CYP51 <coughs> assay that we run. And then these are the hits that we take forward to do chemistry on um, and to progress further in our programs. So I'd like to introduce John here. So John is the person in the lab who runs all the, all the cruise assays. So all, all the things you see uh, are done by him. Um, our routine assay is a bit more complicated than the uh, Brucei assay, obviously, because it's an intracellular assay. So we dispense compounds first in the plates. We then add infected uh, cells. So if cells are infected with a, a clade one T. cruzi strain uh, to the plates, these are incubated for three days. We then image on a high content uh, microscope, and so you can see the parasites in the cells. And then we, auto we have automated analysis that counts um, the parasites. Um, and so our measure in the end is the number of amastigotes per vero cell, uh, and the number of, of host cells is something we look at as well. So in terms of quality, this assay is actually pretty, pretty robust and works well. So we use z-factor to determine this, and we have an average z-factor here of around 0.7. So to date, we have screened um, over 180,000 compounds in single point um, in this assay. Um, and this pie chart just shows you uh, the results. So on the right hand side, you see a scatter plot of host cell inhibition versus cruzi inhibition. And so first thing you can look at is how many compounds are toxic to the host cell. And so that's the ones marked in red, and that's around 10% of what we've screened. Then you can look at which compounds are um, selectively killing cruzi. You can have many different methods of, of determining that. This is a, a straight cutoff, and this shows you that we had around 8% um, hits that killed cruzi. Now, on that large number of compounds, that meant we had over 14,000 hits um, to go through, and so that, that's too many um, to take forward in, in any kind of uh, potency assay. So what we did is we implemented this, this assay we'd never really done before, which was a tri-point assay, where we now screen at three concentrations. Um, the advantage of this is that, first of all, we can do this in a, in a single point plate format. So in terms of compact management, this is much more straightforward. Um, and it gives us immediately an idea of both selectivity of the compound and, potent and potency of the compound without giving us a full sort of um, profile. Uh, so we can run a decent amount of compounds in this, in this assay. So this is the data set for around 600 compounds just all overlaid. So the three colors are the three concentrations that we screen at. And so you have the variable percent inhibition. You, so you get host cell toxicity at the highest concentration, um, and then specific inhibition of cruzi in this area. So you can't really interpret that. So what we do is for each compound individually, I can show each compound individually. And so you can see the different profiles for different compounds. You have a compound here is toxic at 50 micromolar, selective at 10, and not active at 2. Um, this compound here is active and selective at all different concentrations. So this allows us to classify the compounds into groups. Um, and here are the different groups, and so we have the groups that we are interested in, and these are the ones that we take forward for full potency testing. <coughs> so full potency means 10-point curves, um, more challenging in terms of compact management, so the throughput here, the, the theoretical throughput is 448, but we, we don't really uh, achieve that. Um, so, you know, we're at 4,400 compounds now going through this potency assay, and these are the typical results, so you get a potency curve for Cruzi, you get potency curve for the host cell. And so this compound has poor selectivity. This compound has very good selectivity. This assay, as I said, works is pretty robust. So this is uh, replicate potencies plotted against each other, and we see good uh, reproducibility. 
Now, just as we saw in the Bruce I assay, there are a couple of considerations to make when you look at the plateau of inhibition um, seen in this assay. So again, a little outline of our assay. So in this case, we do actually start above the detection limit, but we are not very far above the detection limit in this assay. And so it is actually very difficult to distinguish static from sidal compounds um, with our routine assay. So we implemented, again, a sort of rate of kill um, static sidal format where we significantly increase the detection, uh, the uh, number of parasites that are uh, at, our, at the starting time. And this allows us to distinguish the sidal from the um, static compounds. So this assay um, is based on our, our primary assay. So we add the compounds. The main difference is that we now add much more heavily infected cells. So they've been growing for several days inside the host cell before they're added to the plates. Um, and then we do a time course um, as shown there. So what we see is that, you know, two example compounds, both the Cruzi curves, both of them show us nicely 100% inhibition. When we put them through the uh, static side assay, one compound, which is now Fertimox here, still shows 100% inhibition. The compound on the left now only shows 70% inhibition. So similar to what we saw in, in the Brucei story, um, these compounds are compounds that are near the detection limit and this compound is likely to be static. So if we then look at our growth profile, um, over time, you can see that nifertimox gives you a reduction in number of parasites over time, um, so it shows killing activity, whereas that compound on the, on the left here is just a flat line, so it's actually not killing the parasites, they just sit there. Um, but again, in our routine assay, we saw 100% inhibition. There's a, sec a second factor um, that we have to take into account, um, and that's the kill profile um, of the compounds. So just an example here for nifertimox and posaconazole. So the green line represents nifertimox, um, and so we get quite an early onset of activity, and within 72 hours we reach the maximum uh, killing. Posaconazole is basically about 24 hours delayed compared to that, and so if you make your potency curves with, you, with using nifertimox as control, uh, at 72 hours what you would see is partial inhibition, um, whereas if you measured it 24 hours later you would see full inhibition. So that's exactly what we see, this posaconazole measured at 72 hours and at 96 hours. So even though um, a compound could actually be sidle and killing all the parasites, uh, you may not see that depending on the time point and the, um, the properties of the compound. So basically the plateau depends on whether, whether the compound is sidle, what the initial level of infection is, because the higher it is, the more difficult it is to clear all the parasites, and it depends on the rate of kill and the onset of, uh, of killing. So as I said, as I said, we also um, run a CYP51 assay. So this assay is run uh, by Jennifer Riley in the DMPK group in the lab. So we use this commercial substrate, which is oxidized by uh, Cruzi CYP51 to a fluorescent um, product. So this is done in collaboration with a local company in Dundee um, called Cypex. Um, and so they produce these membrane-bound um, membrane uh, proteins in a, in a bacterial system which have the T-Cruzi CYP51 and they have a reductase that's required uh, for CYP51 activity. So the way we've set this up is that we started with running a panel of um, known CYP51 inhibitors. And what you can see here is the correlation between uh, CYP51, PEC50, so activity against CYP51 and activity against the Cruzi parasite. Um, and so we see a correlation between the two. And what we do then is we overlay all our hit series uh, on top of this graph. And so what you can see is that we have hit series in this area, which are the ones that are not acting through CYP51. And we have a lot of hit series um, that act through CYP51. I think what we found during all our primary screening is that our screen um, or our libraries are very good at picking up CYP51 inhibitors. And I think that's what a lot of people see in that the literature is basically full of CYP51 inhibitors. Um, so either it is a very sensitive target in Cruzi or it is a, a, a bias of the libraries. Um, so basically our screening cascade again, a couple of numbers put against it in terms of how many compounds have gone through it. The best compounds get taken on by our medicinal chemistry team. They improve their, their properties, um, both potency, uh, DMPK properties. And so we put them then into an in vivo efficacy model. And so far, the only model we've run is the, the in vivo um, IVIS imaging model. Um, two, of our compound, two of our series have gone into that model, um, and both series show activity. 
And so, I mean, the numbers are not large here, but for us, it's comforting to see that the, that the molecules that come out at the end of this cascade actually do show uh, initial uh, in vivo activity. How they would work in the long-term model, of course, is, 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 is unknown at this point. Okay, so now I'll switch over to um, Lishmania. Um, so again, a brief introduction. You all know that the current drugs are, are inadequate. Um, and that this is a major killer with 50, over 50,000 deaths um, annually. Um, again, we are looking at an intracellular parasite, um, this time a parasite that mainly resides in macrophages. And so again, the challenge here is to set up an in vitro assay, um, which, which is basically an intracellular assay. We run two assays currently in the, in the DDU. Um, so Andrea uh, News runs our azenic assay, and, and I'll explain how more, I'll go into more detail about the assay later. Uh, but this is a high throughput, straightforward assay. Put the compounds in the plates, add the uh, azenic amastigotes, grow for three days in presence of compounds, and read out how many there are. And then we have the much more complicated intramacrophage assay, where we play THP1 cells, which are differentiated uh, with PMA for three days. We then infect them overnight with the parasites, and then we have a quite difficult step of, you know, at, high throughput adding compounds to infected cells. We then have a four day uh, incubation followed by imaging um, and, and high content uh, analysis. And so this assay is run in the lab by uh, Sujata. So we've been working on um, Leishmania, I think for about four years now in terms of screening. And so over the four years, we've actually um, continuously revisited our screening cascade for Leishmania and continuously adapt to what, what we think we should be doing, um, mostly based on our experiences. And it's been a, quite a hard, uh, difficult learning curve. Uh, but our initial setup was using an azenic assay, which we now call our classic azenic assay, um, to find hits, profile them in the azenic assay and against a human counter screen, and then only take the best hits forward into the INMAC assay. What we found is we get quite high hit rates in this azenic assay, but we get very poor translation into the INMAC assay. Um, because there were so many hits, we also had to put quite stringent criteria in, and so we may actually have missed some hits that were worth taking forward. So after we've screened all our compounds in this, uh, in this format, we decided it was probably not the ideal way to do it. And so we tried again using the INMAC assay now as a primary screening platform. And this is when we moved this assay into 384 well uh, format. And so we screened all our compounds again, single point potency. Um, which wasn't easy because of the throughput of this assay. Uh, but what we basically found is that the INMAC assay, in our INMAC assay, is actually a very high stringency, high threshold assay. And so um, we find hits. All the, all the clinical compounds come up in this assay, um, but we find very few other hits, really. And so it is probably not suitable as a hit discovery platform to find hits that you can then make better and put into the INMAC assay. So we are now moving back to using azenic assays. Um, but not the old classic azenic assay anymore, but what we call the sidal azenic assay. And so I just want to now show you the data, uh, well, first of all, how this assay works, why we are doing this, um, and how we think it is more useful. And this is a work in progress, so, so most of this data is preliminary, and most of it is from the last weeks, actually. So, um, First of all, to explain the difference, and this is starting to look familiar now to you, um, the old azenic assay had a low starting density, significantly below the detection limit, so it could not distinguish between growth slowing, static, and sidal compounds. Obvious thing to do to build the new assay was to increase the starting density, um, but what we also did was change the method of detection and uh, significantly improved the detection limit. So our hypothesis here was that we are getting very high hit rates in the old assay, but low translation because we are looking at a lot of compounds that are not sidal. And the way our INMAC assay is set up, it would only identify sidal compounds. So first thing we did is we picked um, around 600 of our classic azenic hits and put them into the sidal assay and see how many of these 600 hits were actually sidal. And um, what you can see here is that only 13% of the hits actually showed sidal activity, and most of the other hits were basically growth slowing or static hits, uh, which basically immediately explained why we saw such poor translation um, in the INMAC assay. So we, bas we then set out to perform a, a series of validation experiments to try to show um, that 
a nasinic assay can actually be a valuable tool as a primary assay for leishmania screening. This is all uh, basic sing single point data carried out on 17,000 compounds approximately, um, comparing the classic azinic uh, assay in percent inhibition compared to the um, sidal azinic assay. So what you can see first of all is that there was a high uh, false positive rate in the uh, um, classic assay and we have a better false positive rate in the sidal assay. The dots in green I should say are the ones that are in-MAC hits from our primary in-MAC screen. So you can see the numbers here, but basically we have better predictivity from the sidal azinic assay to the extent that now 50% of our hits in the sidal azinic assay also show activity in the in-MAC assay. Which still means that we have false positives. So we have, we have about 50% of compounds that are active in the sidal azinic assay and that are not active in the in-MAC assay. And we also have a series of false negatives that show activity in the in-MAC assay, but not in the sidal azinic assay. And so I've got a couple of slides just giving our initial uh, thoughts on what these rates are and what, why, they are, uh, why they are what they are. Just to say now, okay, we have this cascade, we think it is better, it gives us better predictivity uh, in terms of the EDMAC assay, and it gives us, importantly, the throughput that we need to basically look at hundreds of thousands of molecules. So first of all, false positives. So um, these are compounds that show no activity in the in-MAC assay, but they, act, they, they do kill the, the azinic compounds, or the azinic cells. So our first hypothesis really is that one of the reasons could be that they have poor physical chemical properties in terms of reaching the intracellular emastigode. So the intra intracellular emastigode is hiding between membrane, uh, behind membranes and pH gradients. And so compounds might well not be able to reach there. And so we've done an initial computational analysis comparing the false positives and the real positives. And we found that there is a clear correlation between predicted permeability and activity in the in-MAC assay. So while this is not the only factor, it does seem to be an important factor in terms of um, knowing whether compounds will have activity or not. And so we are expanding on this. We are doing experimental work now. We're going to do permeability assays. We're actually um, starting to look at parasitophorous vacuole compound concentrations uh, to see if this is true. Because uh, ultimately what we would like to do is we would like to take forward some of these sidal false positives and see if we can chemically change them to actually get into the parasitophorous vacuole and then have activity, which would address uh, a, a, new set of, of, um, of a new set of hits basically to work on. Obviously there are other reasons. They might just not be potent enough to kill in our in-MAC assay, uh, which tends to be a bit, um, we see less potency here than in some of the uh, mouse macrophage-based assays. Um, and clearly there is a difference in biology as, as explained very well in the previous presentation, uh, which, which may play a role. So the false negatives uh, is an important consideration. How many compounds are we missing that actually could have in MAC activity? Um, so we had an original rate of 1.8% from this experiment. Um, and so we, we went into a bit more detail analyzing that number. Um, and first of all, we found that around 56% of, of these compounds are actually killing the THP1 cell, and so we don't consider them real um, false negatives. So we do look, when we then look at the um, rest of the population, uh, we did full potency analysis on about 120 of the, other, of the false negatives and found that 50% of the 120 were actually showing activity in both assays. Um, and partially they didn't show up here because it was the side lazinic assay was carried out at a lower concentration. So when you match concentrations, you do actually see a much better um, translation rate. And so our current rate is 0.4% um, false negatives. Reasons for false negatives, um, well, again, mode of action may not, it might not exist in the azinic emastigote. We might be hitting macrophage targets. Compounds may be macrophage activated. Uh, compounds may accumulate in the parasitophorous vacuole. Uh, but two other reasons, actually. Uh, protein binding may be something. So our side lazinic uh, assay runs in higher serum concentration. And so if compounds have a low free fraction, this could actually have an effect. Um, and when you're looking at these sort of numbers now, there are, there are going to be errors in, in process. So this is the last slide really on comparing the two assays. So we've been putting compounds through both assays full, to do full potency to see how well they compare. Um, on the left-hand side, you see a comparison of compounds from our uh, Lishmania um, lead up series. So these are all within the same series. And we see good correlation. Uh, compounds are slightly more potent um, in the side lazinic assay, but basically we, we can even, we can use this assay as, as a ranking method uh, to predict activity in the uh, in-MAC assay. 
This is a very interesting panel of compounds. So this is a panel of compounds provided uh, by DNDI and GSK and the Swiss Tropical Institute. Um, this comprises of standard inhibitors of Leishmania, which are all in blue, and the uh, uh, DNDI lead-up uh, molecules. Um, and so while we're looking in one series here, we're looking across different series here. And so what you can see is that many compounds do show activity um, in both assays. Um, and there is the odd compound, this one, for example, that is much more potent in the side lysinic assay and one that is much more potent in the INMAC assay. So at this point, we don't know the identity of these molecules, and they will be released once all the data has been put together. And so hopefully the mode of action of these different compounds will actually give us clues as to why we see this difference. Right, so just to conclude then, um, two main conclusions. It's very important to have the appropriate design of the, the screening cascade. We always have to balance this high throughput predictive and robustness, predictiveness and robustness. Um, and I think what I've shown you as well is that 100% inhibition in potency curves um, is not 100% killing. And it, you, know, you need to take it with a pinch of salt and you need to really dig into uh, what is going on because you have effects from the assay, starting density detection limit. There are compound effects, um, as I showed, sidle versus static, kill profile. And the cells themselves, different rates of replication may give you different plateaus um, and expression profile of target proteins as well. So it just remains to thank all the people involved in the project. Um, so here is my team. Um, they've worked very hard on this. And we, we have lots of collaborators in uh, Jean Robert, who's, we work closely together at DNDI. Lots of people that are uh, in the audience as well from GSK. Um, our compact management service, well, people that really uh, provide this fantastic uh, service, bringing us plates every week to screen. Um, Alan Fairlam and Susan Wiley. So we have basically academics on site that we can go to for advice, which is very helpful. The DMPK group, particularly Jen, uh, everybody in DDU management, and this is everybody working on the Welcome Trust team. Uh, I'd like to thank DNDI for the invitation and thank you for your attention. And I'll take any questions now. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Manuel. I think this was a, a, a nice demonstration of, of uh, late development in the area of screening of compound for the three diseases. And also, uh, well, we will talk later about uh, lead optimization, but I think here we are talking about uh, screening cascade optimization with secondary assay. That is a bit of a, a, a change that occurred this year with a, sec a lot of new secondary assay that have been developed and might have uh, uh, power to help us to predict better because I think this is what we want. We want to predict better and so far uh, we were not able to. So uh, any questions? In your T. Cruz I presentation, mm -hmm. you went on some detail about the numbers of uh, T. Cruz I in the assay. Did you also look at the different types of uh, human fibroblasts or human fibroblast cell lines or primary fibroblasts, whether that made a difference to your hit rates? Yeah, so we haven't done any of that work. I mean, we, have, we aren't really set up to do this sort of extensive experiments because we're really running high in the high okay. throughput. But it is very important to look at these effects. And so we need to work together with people who can assess a, a panel of host okay. cells. Right. Uh, put, with, yeah. put another way, why did you select Vero cells? Well, basically on, on recommendation of our academic collaborators and because the literature on Cruz I is, is Vero cells are used extensively as, as the model. I mean, I'm by no means saying this is the best cell line to use. Um, so so I, I'm not a T. Cruz I guy, so tell me why Vero cells are the best. I don't know. Do yeah, you know? I, I don't know why they are the best. Okay. Yes. I, I won't say they are the best, and I'm sure Lucio has something to say about that in the next presentation. Um, So you have many people using these cells. Just in fact, Mark Beth is more predictable. You can have systems in human cells. This is something that I'm ready to share uh, with you. But it, it's just much easier to compare if you use already a system that already another lab is using. Because if you need to set up everything from the beginning. No, no, it's not. And we don't know if it's the correct one. I'll admit that. I mean, we had to choose something. And I think more work needs to be done. More work needs to be done. It's always what is predicting the in vivo efficacy. And, and I think there are just too many unknowns at this stage. But uh, the one thing I can say is that whatever has come out of our assay has shown efficacy into the mouse model. And so you know, that's comforting. But it doesn't mean we are not missing things because we're using the wrong host cell. Um, good question, but hard to answer. 
Yeah, Kruta, it infects every cell, but, but the, the expression profile of the host cell will play a role. I mean, so. okay. uh, very fascinating talk. Um, I have a question concerning SIP. Yes. Do you have any idea if SIP 51 is conserved among the different members of the family of Trypanosomatid? It's, it's so important to know, yeah, well, no, it because is we know yeah. the role of SIP is to metabolize the uh, drugs. And yes. let's say, if, do you have any idea if SIP 51 is involved in drug resistance or better in drug responsiveness? Oh, I don't know. I mean, you know, as a drug target, it's, it's a drug target because it's part of the ergosterol pathway and it's an essential yes. component of the membrane. Um, how that varies, bet uh, there clearly seems to be variation between the different clades in cruzi and how they respond to the azoles. Mm -hmm. um, but there's quite limited data around that and we're expanding on that, um, but it is a bit unclear. Okay. But there is variability. Okay, thank you. Jim? Uh, Jim? Yeah. On your left? Oh. Hi, uh, Jim McCarroll from University of California. I can answer a couple of people's questions. In fact, um, uh, Lucio's apprentice, uh, Gier Lage Siguera de Neto, uh, and uh, also Juan Engel, have looked at a number of different cells and cell lines for T. Cruzi, including um, not only Vero cells, but um, more directly uh, muscle cells, including cardiac muscle cells because the parasites invade them, and hepatocytes and macrophages. And their conclusions are basically the same as yours, that the, the really good hits work in all of the different cells. So that's reassuring. Uh, and that's probably what you want because crudite like, can be in many different cells in the body. I don't think we fully understand all exactly. the cells that isn't in the body. So it wouldn't be good if we had one selective cell line where it would work in. Right. And then in terms of the question for CYP51, uh, it is present in the genomes of all the kinetoplasts. However, uh, there is no effect of CYP51 inhibitors on trypanosoma brucei, which I think a lot of people in this audience know, and that's because it has a very different way of making its cell membranes. Um, the information on Leishmania is still out. Uh, there's old literature which suggests uh, effects on some species and not others. And uh, right now, um, Laura Isabel McCall from McGill is doing the gene knockouts in Leishmania in three species, Mexicana, uh, Major, and Donovani. So hopefully that question will be, will be answered. And I would just like to add, I, I know Julio Urbina is in the audience, I'm surprised he didn't comment, but um, I, I think we might as well bring up something that, that maybe we'll come back to and discuss more in the meeting the, uh, about CYP51 as a potential target. Um, I think it'd still be worthwhile looking at the compounds which are CYP51 inhibitors for okay. a number of reasons. Okay, Julio, but very short. Yeah, it's just to, it's just to mention that uh, in in Trypanosoma cruzis, CYP51 is conserved in all uh, strains that have been tested, and in vitro, they are all sensitive around, around the same potency. So the difference in potency are in vivo, and this has to be to do with the uh, parasite location and the <coughs> distribution of the drug in the particular animal model you see. It's an essential housekeeping enzyme, that's all. Mm -hmm. And I don't think any knockout of that will be viable. I mean, Fred Bogner at Washington University, after many efforts, uh, was able to produce a strain of T-cruzide uh, that is partially resistant to ketoconazole and as a consequence to other isoles. Well, uh, well, that particular strain still survived in vitro, but it was not infective at all. So it's not a parasite anymore. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, one more question, if any. Yeah. 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 Uh, yes. Um, did you detect any compounds that were 
active on CYP51 and another mechanism. So you showed some that were not CYP51 active, yep. but some other mechanism. And then you showed CYP51 inhibitors, yes. but yes. It does are look there any that have dual activity? We haven't looked in detail, but it does. There certainly on the curve there are some that have CYP51 activity, but they don't lie on the curve, but they are more potent than the ones that don't hit CYP51 yeah. at all. Yeah. So it is possible that some of our inhibitors have a dual mechanism. Yeah, so would you think that would be a desirable profile? Possibly, mm -hmm. yes, yeah. yes. Okay, thank you, Manu, again. <coughs>